Welcome to this very special In Conversation with Wendy McCarthy AO. Um, I'm Larissa Barron and it's my great privilege to be uh, engaging with Wendy this afternoon. We're going to find out more about Wendy through this panel, but perhaps it's good to start to know by knowing that she's a businesswoman and a change maker who's worked for positive reform across the public, private and community sectors in education, family planning, human rights, public health, uh, and overseas aid and development, as well as conservation, heritage and media, and I'm sure that's not an exhaustive list. But she is also the author of a new book, a captivating second memoir, Don't Be Too Polite Girls. Um, I've had the uh, privilege of co-curating the festival today, and one of the things we wanted to do was to acknowledge the trailblazers, and of course, Wendy McCarthy would be high on that list for a lot of people, but this is also a very personal session for me too because I um, claim Wendy as one of my mentors, uh, a great mentor to me, uh, particularly at times of crisis. You always know who your good mentors are when you call them up when something goes wrong. And she's always taken the time to guide me through um, things. And I know as I meet so many other women, First Nations women, um, men, that she has done the same thing for them as well. So. Um, I think also too, Wendy, for me, your life is really a testament to the change that one person can make. So I hope we can celebrate a little bit of all of that today. But yes. <laughs> so in this session, I want to see if we explore as much as we can, um, and particularly the life you recount in Don't Be Too Polite, Girls. Um, but, and also what it means to support other women, which I think has been a hallmark of the way you've operated. But I thought I would start by asking you the same question that I would have asked a First Nations woman if she was here, and that is if you can tell us um, where you're from and what's shaped your life so you can give us a bit of your perspective. And who's my mob? Oh, yeah, and who's your mob? <laughs> Okay, so where am I from? I suppose I had an itinerant childhood, but I was born in Orange in central western New South Wales. And I lived there for seven years. Then I lived in Goulburn for a year. And then I lived in a little place called Garima, which is north Pacific centre of Canberra in my mind, but a tiny little village um, in a little wheat village, really, where it was the, the, there were big wheat silos and it was the place where the wheat was collected to go to Sydney. And then I went to school in Forbes and, and to the local state high school where I lived in the Anglican hostel next door. And the last year of my schooling I left, um, I did in Tamworth. So I went to half a dozen schools. Um, I did a lot of things that weren't meant to be good for you, but they seemed to be okay to me <laughs> at the time. I was a happy schoolgirl. So that's that, and my, my family's roots in the First Nation tradition, we can't go for 60,000 years that I know of, but the couple of hundred are basically Irish and Scottish. Susan Ryan used to, and I used to have um, little discussions about who was the most Irish. <laughs> I said, I married a man who was born in St Patrick's Day, so that put me ahead. <laughs> but it, we finally had an ancestry test, DNA, I won. 
Only by a tiny bit, but I won't. But I think so, in that question, it's about how you place someone, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you just, we just need to know a little bit about you so we can have a conversation. So that's my little piece. It's great. We always, that's exactly right. It's the kinship system of knowing how everyone's related to yeah. you. All those people who were born in Tamworth will feel an extra connection to you <laughs> yes. now. Um, I guess the other thing that I wanted to ask you about is, of course, the memoir d deals with... Um, many aspects of your life, but you're also very reflective. There's a lot of wisdom in between that. And one thing that struck me was how upfront you are about all your failures. And, um, and when I sort of think of you as being so accomplished, it was almost shocking to me that you might have, for example, failed subjects at university. <laughs> but I thought it might be a good question to ask you as a general thing about, you know, how you look back on failures and what your advice is around, you know, the concept of failing. I think failure and mistakes come into the same sort of lexicon. The best thing about failure is that you learn something. You learn how you did something wrong or how somebody else did in your terms, but you have to cop it. And it's an incredibly stiff learning process. And nobody expects to fail in any of their endeavours in life. We just uh, troll along and think, you know, it's going to be OK, whatever we do. And then we're hit with a failure. In my case, failing in first year university, I had a scholarship which required me to pass four subjects. It was a five-year scholarship, um, four-year scholarship at university. And I passed two. And I didn't pass English, which was meant to be my best subject. Now, I wasn't... I was 16 and I didn't get Chaucer. I just couldn't get it. <laughs> and I probably was 60 before I did, really. But I think I learned that the thing about failure is, firstly, I found a resilience in myself to be able to get back after failure. In this case, I went to the Department of Education and said, I know, I, I had to argue to get an appointment because they were written to me saying my scholarship was going to be cancelled. I had to pass three or four. And I said, I know that's happened, but my father died during the year, my life has been unstable, and I really would like another chance. And if I promise that I will do four subjects in the second year, which would mean two at second year level and, you know, the others at first year level, um, can I have my scholarship back? And they said, OK. Now, that also taught me that you can follow up on failure and make a commitment to try again and do something differently and I did. And in the process, the most outstanding thing was, instead of just being in love with boys and rock and roll and other things, as I was in my first year, I fell in love with learning. And I've never fallen out of love with learning. So the best thing out of that misfortune. And other failures I've meant, you know, getting pregnant accidentally wasn't a good idea. And, uh, well, it wasn't accidental, really. I mean, I had sex, I got pregnant. Um, <laughs> But I do think that most failures are fixable if, and you have to hold on to that. But you'd be an unusual person who hadn't failed and you're probably kidding yourself if that's the case. Just cherish it and remember it and polish it up and get, just keep going. You write with um, real affection about some of the teachers you had and it's wonderful to be reminded that actually that's where you started out. And wonder if you can share with us um, where you get that great affection for teachers, teaching, and the fact that you are really still continuing to be a teacher. Yes, I often say, you know, that I, I always think of myself as a teacher. It's just that I work in different classrooms. And some boardrooms, they would qualify for high learning needs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some schools do and some pupils do. But humans are the same in most settings um, and they just need sometimes to be unravelled. But great, when you think of great teachers, if we're lucky, we might get three or four in our lives. We might get good enough, for, hopefully for the majority. But what we really want is teachers who inspire us in, in us a love of learning. And what I learnt after my first year of teaching in high school is that control and command is not the way to learn. It's the way to repeat information and reprocess it, and it'll get you quite a long way, certainly in my school system, but it's not true learning. It, true learning is when you take the responsibility on, upon yourself to be able to take that information and process it and use it for your life. And when I was sent, setting up 
um, a mentoring practice many, many years later, one of the things I realised, it was just like being in my classroom in the first couple of years of teaching, getting people to hear their own voices. That little girl in the back of the room there, I can see what you're doing, it's okay, but could we all hear it? And it's a big surprise because she just thinks she's talking to the girl next to her like that. And I think that we, I want to hear a voice. I'm not punishing you, I just want to hear it. If it's that good, do you want to say it now? Let's all hear. But there's just a, there's something magic about exchanging information with a mentee and seeing a voice can just sort of be... Your words get reflected and hers come out or his come out and suddenly he's in charge and you're superfluous. It's OK. You can be friends after that, but you just have a moment when you get that magic of mentoring. And I would like all organisations I work in to be mentoring. And in teaching too, I went from a classroom to community education. And I'd never done... Most of the things I've done, I'd never done before I did it. You know, like, bang, I got an offer of a job. They said, you can be the community educator of family planning. And I thought, well, what does that mean? Anyway, it meant that I taught in probably 100 high schools over a couple of years, taught in universities, TAFE colleges, hospitals, you know, e every single conceivable person. So I had to learn to be a teacher for all seasons. And there's a magnificent book on teaching by Frank McCourt, who probably most of you know was the writer of Angela's At Ashes. But he writes a book called Teacher Man. I so strongly recommend it. It's about a life before he ever was famous as an author where he was writing about being in a school in New York when he first arrived from Ireland, learning to communicate with seemingly Teflon boys and finally finding a way. And it was all about a quality of voice. It's a really beautiful book. The, um, the book starts at the moment that the legislation to legalising abortion recently was in the House. And it really is an issue that you had spent... Um, you know, over 50 years, 50 years fighting for. I just wonder, um, I guess it's the inevitable question, really. Um, what's your reflection as we sit here now of how far we've come but how far we've got to go? Um, it's a, it, it is still the best question, Larissa, because it's a moving foot way and there are many... Th I mean, if, if you put it in a balance sheet, the beginning of my life the opportunities and protections that women had would be at the zero point, and I'd say we're up to about 70%. And, that's it, in, and it is so. I didn't grow up knowing anything about human rights. So we're not framed in a rights issue. So we had to learn that. But the two fundamental issues for women to be equal in society are about their health, and about their education. The profound um, success of my generation of feminists was women's education. And for that, I could say thank you, Gough Whitlam, every single night. And in my case, I could actually say thank you to Menzies because I got to university. And that was the first little door that opened and the scholarship system. And Whitlam expanded that because he could see, with heavy nagging from Susan Ryan and other people, that girls were not finishing secondary school. So they had no choices. And then we could see our mothers and many other women we knew who had never had a formal education past the age of about 14 were longing for it. They could see their daughters out there. And it, it caused joy and happiness as well as conflict between generations. And so we introduced this idea, which we lobbied for for ages, called second chance education. So a woman who was had prior experience, wanted to go to university, didn't have to matriculate. Often they'd come to TAFE and I'd be teaching them often in TAFE. And it was so inspiring to see a woman of 55 who'd, you know, she'd been in the, um, the Army or the Air Force or something during the war, comes back, expected to go straight back to the Land Army, um, expect to go straight back to the kitchen. The men got scholarships to go to law engineering and so on, and as part of the repatriation, and, and women didn't. So those women have become... Very, the women who got the second chance education it supported the young feminists who were pushing the barriers. No-one does anything on their own. 
I might look cute or old or whatever I do up here now, but you know what? You're not in a society. If you're going to be an engaged citizen, you need colleagues. You need people who travel with you, who share your ideas. You might call that a form of leadership. You might call it a form of community organisation. But no one does anything. So we learned to organise. That's a real thing that came out of this research. We changed education. Women flock to education. We are number one in the world on the education of women. And we are number 50 in gender parity. How the hell did that happen? Where were you all? Where were we all? How did we lose that spot? And in terms of equal pay, we're somewhere in the middle of the world. And many countries that we would be offering overseas aid to are behind us. So we don't need to be too smug. However, we are in different cl clusters. We are professional lawyers and we are doctors and in health places. So we are looking after the women coming behind us. We have to stay in the care economy. We have to make sure that it is better work in the care economy because that's what feminism can do. The men are not going to do it for us. And it's just systemic. And you don't have time for a lot of work in systemic as well as individual change. You've got to make some choices. So I think we should be looking at, and, and Sam Most and I have this discussion all the time, we now need to lift the women in the care economy further up the system so that wealth distribution is more efficient and effective because they, and they have taken a disproportionate load during the pandemic. It, there's nothing malignant about that happening or men causing it. It's just that women are, as one woman said to me, at the moment in my home during the, I have, I'm running a school for three children. I'm running the kitchen for the family. I'm trying to hold on my on to my job at one o'clock in the morning while I'm going online. I just can't do it all. I need some help. So those women, that, we want to care about people. That's what we do really well. We do other things too, but we care about people well. So I think that's the next step. And I think the other thing is that the last thing I would say is that the surge towards women into politics has slowed down. We need more women in leadership positions in politics. And people say, oh, well, it won't be that much fun. Well, it could be if you were there. But you'd have fun. You, don't, you know, poli political change is exciting. You don't all have to belong to a party to do political change. You can be part of Women for Election, which is one really great group. And there's, you know, th there are other places too where you can find a way to map a different life. And I'm 80, guys. You're going to live until you're 90. Anyone who's under 50 here is on the way to 90. So you've got plenty of time. You don't have to do it all at once and you don't have to do it before you're 30 or 40 or 50, but you do have to keep on keeping on and that's where the balance sheet for women is right this minute. That was a very long answer, I'm well, sorry. That was a very good one. Idea. It was a very big <laughs> question. <laughs> Um, one of the things, of course, that your memoir reminds a reader of is how many um, barriers were placed on women that I think a younger generation might not appreciate, not being able to get a bank yep. loan, having to leave a job when you got married, not being able to access contraception or abortion. No super. No super, all of those things. And I guess the question that, that I wonder, and I think about this a lot in the First Nations context where we're always you know, making sure people don't forget the history yep. because it's a very big part of people understanding why things remain so important. But um, do you think there's a danger that we're forgetting those yes. issues? And, and what are your ideas on how we can make sure that doesn't happen? Look, one of the reasons I wrote the book is I wanted to tell the stories. You just need to hear the stories. So I go to the Bank of New South Wales. I'm a first year out teacher. I want to buy a car. I could make an appointment with the bank manager. Teachers had equal pay the first year I started teaching. So I was earning the same as the bloke next door and I asked for a loan and he says um, could your father sign the guarantee form and I say no my father's dead well he said that's unfortunate he said perhaps you've got a brother and I said yes I do have a brother oh good he could sign well no he's 14 <laughs> I didn't get the loan I should have lied and said he was 20 and made him write his name Kerry Ryan I'm 18 or something 
but he, would, he could have got it at 18. So that can be terribly confronting for you because you're seen of no value. You know, you're a worthless person. You're not reliable. And even when I went to London, I was still so stupid that I banked with the same bank. You know, now I wouldn't do that. And I go to the bank in London and he says, could you bring your husband in to talk about your weekly budget? I said, why would I do that? I'm going to be earning more than him in London. <laughs> I was tax-free for two years and the teachers were tax-free. So they've lost a lot of those benefits. Mm. And I go, they, he goes, well, I can't, certainly can't give you a loan without your husband. And I, if I was you, I suggest you put your money in your husband's account and you learn to budget together. I mean, it's ridiculous. I'm getting my tubes tied. And they say, you, we will need your husband's consent. No, they're my tubes. Well, um, nobody here has ever been, had their tubes tied without um, their husband's consent. I found that was a big lie as well as a secret. Um, and I said, well, anyway, the gynaecologist is walking past it. The is, you know, talking down to me. I said, you've got to have your husband sign this form before we can do this. And my doctor came walking past and he said, don't argue with the mate. We're just going into the theatre now. Come on. <laughs> And you know, they're good stories to tell, and I tell it in that way because they're human stories, but you've got to find your way out. So every time one of those things happen to me, there's a part of my brain computing mm -hmm. that says, I don't want that to happen to anyone else. I'm going to find a way. But I had to find the right company of women to make those changes, and that didn't happen for some years later. But I realise now all those things were you know, moving up in my head and stacking up and thinking about those things and then all those wonderful feminist writers started writing and I thought oh I'm going to be a feminist I think yes <laughs> <laughs> well you you uh, worked across uh, many areas as I mentioned in the introduction where you've made change but I think it is worth pointing out that one of the areas of significant trailblazing you did was in the boardrooms um, and I wonder if you could talk a bit about why given so much of, of your focus had been on things in the public and community sector why um, the private sector was something that you also felt you needed to conquer? You know, there's a really short answer. I just was so enraged with the um, paternalistic, sort of patronising attitude of people in the private sector, as though the market response was everything. And what you did in the public sector was sort of, you know, girls play or you know, maybe you're in the sand pit or whatever you were doing, it didn't amount to the same thing. And it was really exemplified when an international woman, great fame, whom I won't mention, leading a big company, wrote to me and I knew I was on a board with her husband in, um, in plan, so, and so, which was an overseas aid agency. And so she wrote to me and said she was coming and would, would I like to get a few women around and have lunch. Well, it was quite funny. So we booked the restaurant in the Opera House because she'd never been to Australia and she wanted to see the Opera House. And um, her helicopter dropped her at the right place. <laughs> <laughs> and there were about 30 women there. And she talked about how she was introducing affirmative action. Now, Australia was the first country in the world to have decent sex discrimination legislation nationally. And she talked about how she'd written guidelines and got a workforce. And it's all true, she got a fabulous workforce with this big international company. She, she was a woman of colour. And in the women in the room, I was the only one in the room who worked for a not-for-profit, for-purpose business. And they said, this is fantastic. I said, all of these things are in the Affirmative Action Guidelines, the Sex Discrimination Act and every bit of public sector. If you go on a board in the public sector, you get all sorts of help and development and training. Come on. And they said to a person, we wouldn't take any notice of it if it was in the public sector. And that enraged me. And then I felt, to my shame, that I'd been, I really did sincerely feel that somehow I, I was lesser I mean, I was a deputy chair of the ABC, and I mean, it's not an easy organisation to be a deputy chair of. I mean, I love it to death, but you, uh, the idea that there's something inferior about statutory bodies is just... Uh, that just sends me in a complete rage. <laughs> so I thought, OK, I'll have to prove that I can be commercial. So very shortly afterwards, I took an offer that had been on the table for some time when I was running the national test to go and run a 
um, legal practice. My husband said, do you have any idea what you're going to? You'll hate it. I said, no, I've got to be commercial. I can see that. I'm going to get anywhere in this life. I'm 55. It's got to be commercial. He said, you've been commercial all your life. You know, it's just a different way of doing it. And I said, no, don't tell me. Don't tell me. <laughs> anyway, so I line up. Well, it's in the Fin Review. First woman without a legal degree runs, you know, legal practice and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, oh, okay. So I read, you know, I and I worked with them for a year. It was nothing like I thought law would be. It was more or less exactly what my husband said a partnership would be. <laughs> and I thought, so what's the secret? So what I found was that often what you anticipate is not what you're going to get. So you have to find your own way of doing it. And then, I mean, but, but that was an executive role. And, I, and then I started to go on to boards. That reaffirmed to people that I could do more than run something in the public sector, which is a horrible way of saying it, but that's what it did. And I took that up and I went on to... I've been on 34 boards. It's probably Guinness Book of Records, really. Um, but, you know, I did then go on to commercial boards and then I became really interested in how you put for-profit with for-purpose so you are investing the profit in there. And Good Start was the classic case. The work, working as a director of Good Start, where you know, you're in early childhood learning and it's a billion dollar company and no one on the board or anywhere else in the company gets the profits. It goes straight back into the business. So it's best business practice with better intentions. And I, it did, did satisfy me, but to go there, but I found myself very soon drifting back to something or drifting towards a good staff model because just a commercial one wasn't... There, there wasn't enough soul in it for me. I mean, I liked the skill of it and, and I never left without putting two women to replace me, not because that was the case, but working out when someone else is leaving, I'd leave and then out. Two women, OK. And I, and I, I have to say, it, I feel almost shameful about it in a way, but it did feel, feel as though it was validation. Um, so I thought, oh, well, I'll take that. <laughs> um, you write in the book that you like to be asked to dance and Sam Mostyn at the launch said that this uh, sounded like cognitive dissonance to her at first, <laughs> which I have to say I had the same reaction when I was reading it. Um, I, in fact, I went back and read it to make sure I wasn't reading it incorrectly. But actually, you make a really good point about being... Um, approach to be involved in something. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why that's been your modus operandi. Well, I think, you know, there are some things that your parents drum into you that you it, it's very hard to get out of. My mother spent a lot of time reinforcing the idea that I should not be bold. Boldness was a terrible sin for a girl and it was an admired attribute for a boy. Um, and not that I thought of it in those terms then, I just knew that as a girl I should not be bold. That means speaking back to your elders, seen, uh, you know, to being seen and not heard, um, and, or being heard and, not, and seen, which was, there was not acceptable, and always t told to, to sit on the side of the room and wait until you were selected by some boy to dance. Well, now if... In my family, you know, the blokes are sitting on the side, really, and uh, the girls are dancing, and just out of sheer joy and pleasure, and, it's, and, and those conventions have gone. But it was a really thing. It was like, don't be too pushy. My mother said, don't draw attention to yourself. The best example of this is she's watching the Hollingworth interview. Remember when the Holling... Some of you will remember the Hollingworth matter, where interviewing, Kerry O'Brien was interviewing Hollingworth and he suggested that the girl at the centre of a case um, calling, uh, saying a bishop had sexually abused her had actually asked for it. He didn't say quite like that but everyone knew that was the code for it. And my mother rang me up and she said, this girl and I shared um, a bunk in St John's Hostel in Forbes. And I hadn't seen it, but, you know, I'd seen it to them twice in 30 years but I got, uh, Anyway, she, and she's, and, uh, she said, you know that's not true. So you're to ring the ABC right now and tell them it's not true and it's a terrible thing to say. And 
I'm quite surprised. I think she's been reading feminist literature secretly. You know, what's she doing? She just, don't, my usual call. She said, but what I want you to do when you ring, don't say who you are, don't draw attention to yourself, <laughs> and, and just leave the message. And I said, well, I don't think that would work if I didn't say who I was. And I've just left the board of the ABC, so I think my voice is fairly recognisable. <laughs> and anyway, after about, you know, 24 hours, I decided I could do it. And, you know, I went on and did it. And she didn't reprimand me for it, but it was a very interesting thing. And but I must have been 60-something then, you know, that, that, but they're deep, you know, we know the Jesuits say, give me a child until the child's seven. They're really deep things. So in cases of, I am really good at running a campaign. I can take anyone and put them out there and get on with it. But I do not like asking, I do not ask favours for myself. I find it extraordinarily hard to put myself first. I can, it's just, and it is still that thing, you know. And I think most girls of my age were raised like that. And they've, and that has been somewhat despised as showing a lack of capacity to initiate discussion, not able to put your hand up, um, no good in the scrum. Um, that was true until about ten years ago. <laughs> the girls are in the scrum now, which is great. But I, I and it, it's a deep impact. And. And, of course, girls didn't dance together. I mean, because then people would have thought they were gay. Not, not, not that I knew what gay was at that stage. But and, and there are a lot of the things that have changed. You just unpack that. You go talk to your friends and you go home and you think about why you would have to ask, why you would have to wait for someone to choose you. And that's about grooming as well. That's where people who groom people, for ulterior purposes, start. Anyway, I didn't get groomed. Um, I've heard Fran Kelly describe um, your book, Don't Be Too Polite Girls, as a book of feminism, friends, focus and family. And I love that account of it. As, as you know, Wendy, um, I had uh, one of those light bulb moments um, in, in terms of the things you've taught me when I um, heard the wonderful eulogy you delivered for your husband at his funeral. And one of the things that uh, struck me as I went outside and I mentioned this to my husband was... You mentioned so many wonderful things about the times you'd had together and not once did you talk about work and it was a real wake-up call for me to think about my own priorities. So I wondered if you could talk a bit about how you have found that work-life balance because one thing that comes through when you're writing and with anyone who knows you is that you have a very rich family life and a very loving family. Some, well, I always wanted to have a rich family life. Mine got a bit fragmented. But there was lots of love in it. But I wanted, you know, I just wa I wanted a marriage with a man who I thought was, we would share, we would be a partnership. And, but, and, and I found that man. And uh, the whole chapter about it's in the Sunday Life magazine today, just as a matter of background, <laughs> <laughs> including the sex, drugs, rock and roll. Um, but I. And when the feminist movement started, there was a very separate movement in some ways. There were the, the women's liberationists who were the, you know, the, the really big change makers, and that was across the world. You know, I lived in America and London during those times, and I was seeing a whole new definition of women. It was extraordinary. My, my head was spinning around half the time. So, so exciting. And so when I came back and I evolved into my own definition of myself as a feminist, and people would say, well, you know, you haven't got overalls. And I said, I have. I've got really nice pur purple overalls. You know, I love fashion. I've got, got a yellow T-shirt to work with it, wear with it too. But that's not what defines a feminist. What defines a feminist is a sense of self as a woman. And that was who I was. And so I thought, and being criticised when I had a third child because there was zero population growth time and I was just lucky I didn't have a fourth, really. Um, but I thought if you can't be a feminist and have a partnership and a baby, a marriage and a baby, who the hell is going to want to be a feminist? Mm -hmm. You want to be a feminist as part of your life and your partnership with... You know, in those days we thought probably only of men because that's the other thing that's changed. Marriage equality 
has changed so much for people's brain to be able to think of other possibilities in life and partnerships. So for me, that was always important. And, and it was really important to my husband too. I'm the eldest child in the family, you probably guess. Um, and uh, he was the youngest. And there was a real thing for us about growing families. And, you know, we had fam we instigated in our both sides, McCarthy's and Ryan's uh, families, things together. I mean, my children and grandchildren, I would, you know, for the rest of the world could disintegrate and I'd be out there protecting them because they matter the most to me in life. But as I say that, it's about finding, you know, about having a family and there are lots of ways to put families together. But if you can find a partner who wants to do the same thing or you learn together to do the same thing. I mean, I don't think we ever talked particularly about having children except we wanted to at some stage and we didn't have children until three years after we were married. So we, we had a lot of time to get to know each other and a lot of time to work out what mattered. And, you know, when there's a lovely statement about, you know, call it a family, um, call it a mob, everyone's looking for kin. And we are looking for someone with whom we have an extra special relationship to. And it doesn't, it doesn't exclude the close friends of our lives, but it knows that there is a connection. And of course, that's a really strong thing in First Nations family. Mm. And when you grew up in the country, you could see that even though they were the most dispossessed people in that, they stuck together, family stuck together. Now, I'm just going to make a bit of a shout out because you can send through questions for me. And those of you who see me in earlier panels might feel somewhat sceptical about how I can use this iPad, but I assure you, I'm getting the hang of it now, so please do feel free to send them through. Um, one of the things that I've learnt from you is the importance of establishing a peer group. And you did allude to this a little bit before when you said you needed to find some like-minded women. But I think of all the work you've done through things like Well and uh, Chief Executive Women, and that, that um, creating of, um, I think we've called it structured collegiality when we've had a talk about it, which is a great concept. I wonder if you could talk about why that has been so important to you and particularly because you have found a way to make that space inclusive when you've, you know, as is mentioned, you've um, mentored a lot of First Nations people. Yes, and I must say that um, I'll come back to the mentoring First Nation people in a minute, but I, th I think that we were reading, almost reading a lot of literature. Many of the first generation of feminists were teachers and, uh, and I think that was... That was often a sense of social rep, um, reciprocity because you had a teacher's college scholarship. I had a, you know, a bond I had to teach for five years, although I could marry after three years and have my scholarship uh, waived, my, my fees waived. A man couldn't do that. It took me 10 years to work out, or maybe 20, that actually that was structured, a different kind of collegiality. The man would have the career and the woman had the job. So you could pay back your investment and then by then you were way behind and you weren't going to be a school principal. So, but I think it was about sharing and I also think it is about, I was that generation where we went out without our husbands. You know, the women's movement, we weren't taking the husbands with us. It, we, it was women's business. We wanted to talk about it. We wanted women's commissions. We, you know, we talked about our hair, our vaginas, our shoes, our feet, our ambition. And when we heard stories from other women and put them together, we could see, well, there's no maternity leave, there's no childcare, um, you've got to leave the public sector if you got married. You know, there are all these barriers, you can't borrow money. So what are we going to do about it? And like good girls, we had a shopping list. Tick, 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 tick. And you know, it's the same shopping list now, the ticks are just in a different position. So we still need more early learning and childcare. We still need... Um, more investment in reproductive rights for all sorts of... And, and I mean, the, uh, I remember <laughs> it was one, uh, one uh, demo that I went to where one of the young women who worked for me wore... She tied two tampons together and put them on her ears as earrings so they moved on each side as she went down. And there were men who called out names to her. It was walking down George Street. I was fascinated. These tampons are going... And... Those were sort of outrageous acts of, this is normal, you know? It's not normal to wear a tampon on your ear. 
but it's normal women's business. Now, just let us get on with it. <laughs> and I, th I just think that it's... We sort of de demystified it by having those conversations of our own, but out of that became a, a collegiality which demonstrated in the reproductive rights campaign. Most of the women at the front of that were women of my age, give or take a decade, and they were women we worked together planning these things in the 70s, and we saw it as unfinished business. Most young women didn't know that this was the case. They couldn't understand quite why we were doing it, wanted to just leave it alone. Well, we leave, didn't leave it alone because it was still a dangerous health matter. And it required a collegiality which looked across the world at what was happening because we're much more connected now with people around the world and we could see what hap was happening with Trump. And also in, in that process, you start to realise you have a responsibility for what I call pull through. There's a whole lot of people coming along behind. You're not in their way, but you're in their space. And there's a difference. So you have to work out how to make that space elastic and how exciting it can be when you start working with someone like Larissa. She has a different view of the world. I adore her, I, you know, I read a book, so I follow her life. I also happen to call like a husband a life, that's a help because there are two people in that relationship that I feel extremely fond of but that is also a structured collegiality in a way because I can ring you and ask you things and you know, in the last couple, of, last couple of weeks where there's been concern about women of colour and younger women missing out because the white firms are in the front of them, it's true, but I don't want to die tomorrow just yet, you know, that just a little bit longer. I think we just have to find the space and we have to, it, I have to find a way to say this without ever sounding patronising. Far better to extend my space and my friendships and my relationships to them then just quit the scene altogether because we're richer together. Yes. And, you know, one of um, Larissa's friends, Tanya, Tanya Hosh, she's a really good friend of mine and, and that's for over 20 years. And I've learned a lot. And I learned from Linda Burney what truth to power meant. I can remember it vividly. We were visiting a high school in the Hunter Valley when we were on the Education Commission and she started talking about truth to power and I said, what's that? And she explained it to me and I've never forgotten because in a way that's what feminism was doing. Truth to power, sharing stories, working out how you can be powerful together and finding, trying to find some sort of consensus on what will be the trigger point for continuing success. Look at her. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, there's just been a question that's come through that I might just toss in now because it feels like a good follow-on. Um, from what you've just been talking about. And the question is, what would you like diverse young women to walk away with today? Um, I'd like them to value themselves. I'd like them to stare down people who limit their thinking and limit their activities. I'd like them to think about keeping their head and hearts together if it doesn't feel right in your gut, you can be pretty sure it's wrong. In, and your gut is a very, very good way. When I do things without my head and heart connected, I feel sick and I know. And I've done it a couple of times. I've done it thinking, I'm just being silly. I'm going, definitely going to do this. It's invariably wrong and you have to get out of it fast. And the other piece of advice, very pragmatic advice I would offer, I received at the age of 16 and I was in my first year at university, I'd been there six weeks and there was a sign went up in the union to say a bishop was coming to talk about sex. So we all said, well, what bishops know about sex? Oh, well, subsequently <laughs> we found quite a lot but it wasn't there. <laughs> anyway, so we all go along to the common room and he gets up to speak and actually he, I don't remember anything else he said other than what this. He said, life's a long journey. And he said, but you can put it into days and you can make every day count. So there's 24 hours. You can play eight, sleep eight and work eight. And pretty well, that's how I put the clock on myself about what I do in life. 
And when it goes out of whack, which of course it does at times, um, you just make sure you correct later because you need to stay healthy, you need to have fun. Life's not meant to be misery road. It's meant to be a happy learning place. And if you can just do that, it gives you a little, just a little bit of a guide um, about how to use your time and make every day count. When we just looked in the last week, Shane Warne and Kimberly Kitching, two people of 52, people who would have been expected on the chart, life charts to get to 85. You don't want to waste any time before you get there. Just make it count, especially with the people you love. Well, that sounds like a very good point for me to go to my next bit, which I wanted to kind of do some speed dating mentoring advice with you. And so I'm going to just ask for your top bits of advice on the following things, because that seemed like a very good life, work-life mm -hmm. balance bit. Mm. But what about career advice? Well, I think head and heart as well. If, um, if you can go there when you don't actually know much about the business, but you're willing to learn. But you've got to go to a business where there is your own integrity is not going to be challenged and it's an ethically responsible place for you. And if an ethically responsible place for you is building firearms, well, I'm sure you'll do it well. But you've got to find your own space. So I think head and heart matters because work is so important to our definition of ourselves. If we're trying to do it as human beings, keeping head and heart together, it has to be reflected in what we do for eight hours of our day at least. Relationship advice. Ah, oh, relationship advice. <laughs> <laughs> I... When I wrote the Clio column, which may surprise some of you, I did it for 10 years and I learned a lot from the people who wrote in, but one of the things I would constantly say, like an old mantra really, the best relationship in love is between equals. That's a good one. Parenting advice. Hmm. <laughs> would my children like to leave the room now? <laughs> um, well, I guess the, the child who has the best start in life is a child who is wanted, probably planned, um, and much loved, and whose parents have the capacity to ask for help when needed. And lots of people, lots, lots of families are put under pressure to know it all when they're young parents, and it's very, very hard to be a young parent. So I... I yeah, I don't think I would add anything else to that. Fashion advice. And anyone who knows your book... <laughs> Ask Carla. <laughs> where, where is Carla when we need her? <laughs> Look, I think of clothes as theatre. And I think... Um, well, you do good theatre. <laughs> but I think that... When... Well, I'll start with this. Arrivals and exits matter. Births and funerals matter. Rites of passage matter. When you arrive and walk into a room, what impression do you want to make? Do you want to be in your blue jeans? Do you want to be, you know, in something else? Do you want to be in heels or sneakers or whatever? But whatever you're assembling on your outer body says something about you. And there's no point in ever pretending that it doesn't. So what you wear is part of who you are and part of the effect that you have on other people. So you find someone who makes clothes, or for years I made my own, and still got a bit, they looked a bit ordinary. <laughs> um, and I think that, I mean, I, I think Carla Zampatti did that for Australian women in a way no other designer has done. But I do think that you need to find a place and way. I mean, I went into Zara yesterday, which, you know, great store. You don't have to go to, you know, expensive places to find things that make you reinforce who you are or give you a whole opportunity to be something different. And I think the same much, you know, about funerals, that people, when, when you have a funeral, it's, it's a rite of passage and we all need to feel that we're identifying with the person whose um, funeral we're at in even when we, what we wear when we pay respect. Some people it's colour, some people it's black. Whatever. 
I did wear my Carla cape just for you today. I know, she does. <laughs> um, here's a really great question for you, given uh, your passion around teaching. Uh, how can we value teachers more and what can teachers do to change a system that doesn't always value diverse voices? I have to say, I think teachers as a profession are the most ripped off... Teachers and nurses are being the most ripped off professions in Australia at the moment, and it is totally outrageous. Um, and they're going to have to... Well, no, that's a bit directive. They probably need to rethink what it is that they're doing in the classroom, and they need to take back control of their profession because they're being defined by other people. And I think as that, those people are defining you, you lose your confidence. I mean, we have some outstanding schools. And of course, the other problem is, and there's no, you can't put, you know, you can't put lipstick on the pig. The funding for public education is now seen as funding for the safety, set, you know, safety instead of education and leadership of our community. It's a bit like the public-private divide. I mean, I, to think that people think that going to a state school is something to be ashamed of is awful. Now, I know lots of parents, and I was one of them, who went, whose children went to fabulous primary schools and then make just different decisions about secondary schools. I think that that's probably where... But if you go to the school in the community, you have a community behind you for the rest of your life. And... I think that for teachers who are being paid less in the public system, they are the, the public system of education is the platform for learning in our, in our world and country. And if we don't respect it, they need to be paid more, they need to have better working conditions. How is it that schools, so many schools, don't have air conditioning systems? It's outrageous. They don't have proper toilets. Still schools in western suburbs, they, they don't have proper health services. And it's too much to expect the, the overloaded teacher to be able to do all these things. And that, of course, is why good teachers often go to the independent system. And on, in a secular country, I think it is dangerous to have too many faith-based schools. That's my personal view. I think it's very, very scary. <laughs> You um, say that you want to, don't want to chronicle how we felt but what we did. And I love that as an idea because it's a real call to arms. And I guess we're living in a time, we've just been through the pandemic, we're not through it yet, um, you know, it, but it's been very disruptive. Uh, we're seeing cataclysmic climate issues that are changing the way we're relating to our country. And, of course, we've got these massive geopolitical shifts that are terrifying if one looks at them at all. Um, can't look away from them, so they are incredibly challenging. In the face of all of that, Wendy, as somebody who has, as I've said at the beginning, really been somebody who's shown what a difference an individual can make, what is your advice to us in terms of how we can continue to feel we've got some agency in this kind of environment? Um, well, we have one thing at our disposal, we have a vote. We need to start exercising our vote. We, um, I'm going to support the independents in, in this election. Um, I think change is necessary. And I think that... I think that we have to remain as an engaged citizen. And when we see opportunities to do things, can, they can be the smallest things in the community. They can be th think acts of kindness, taking food. I mean, I, I was this morning just watching The Insiders and watching that man's bottom lip tremble when he talked about not being able to know where his family was going to sleep tonight. And it was a young man and it was obviously extraordinarily depressing. So to say that on television gives him a vulnerability that he might not otherwise have had. And that is a moment for opportunity for other people to do things because we're all vulnerable in some way. I always found finding a group of like-minded citizens, which was always Margaret Mead's advice, that change is only ever made by a group of like-minded citizens coming together and working out something. She said, and usually a group of 12 does it. 
the effect of the disciples, of course, but still. But I think that's true and I think you just have to engage with people. It's hard to be... I was never... A, I mean, I might have been a lone voice at times, but I was never a lone person. There was a community of women and some men, always, that I was relating to. Just getting close to time, but it sort of feels like it's a good thing to have as a final thing to ask your reflections on. Of course, in the book um, itself, you are... Um, towards the, at the end, you talk about the Uluru Statement. Why is that such an important thing for you? I think the Uluru, Uluru Station, uh, Statement is up there with Magna Carta. I think it's one of, one of the most exquisitely written statements. A statement's even a hard word to use on it. The words are beautiful. There's a generosity of spirit. There's a reaching out for really structured collegiality. There's a reaching out for love of First Nations people and, you know, and, and reciprocity. And underneath it, the sense of injustice is not bitter and ugly. It's just wistful. And I want everyone to have... And I thought, my next thing is everything I do, I'm going to add the Uluru Station where, statement wherever I can so that people can't say, I can't see it. Not that I'm expecting to sell 30 million books, but... I do think that it's got to be everywhere for people to understand. And, you know, as we do Welcome to Country, there are places where we could be reading the Uluru Statement at functions to remind people of the beauty of the word crafting, the request which is so modest, and the generosity of soul and spirit that says, can we walk together? And of course we can. You know, just expand your circle. And we're going to try and do it. <laughs> I want that to happen in my lifetime. <laughs> so Wendy's book is, of course, available, as you might be aware. We don't have a signing table because of COVID. But Wendy will be around. So I'm sure if you mask up and approach her, she'll be happy to sign. If you didn't get to ask a question that you were too shy to or I wasn't using the iPad like I was supposed to and didn't realise, then please, I'm sure you'll know how generous she is and I'm sure she'll happily do that. Can you thank me in joining Wendy, not just for what she's shared during this session, but her life of activism, generosity, inspiration and contribution to public life and a better and fairer society. Thank you. Oh, that feels good. <laughs>